In this video, you're going to see me asking questions about how we can have more effective conversations about race. This is not um, the, the common topic here. Obviously, if you do watch these videos or if you are aware of the content that is usually produced here, but more and more, I will be engaging in more so societal conversations or, or bigger topics that I think are directly related to our individual and collective psychology. Unless you've been living under, <laughs> I don't know, a soundproof tent for the last handful of years, you will have come across conversations about race, identity, groupthink, cultural identity, all of these different topics. And in my opinion, we are not having effective or productive conversations on these topics. So in this video, you're going to see me talking to John McWhorter, who is a well-known author and intellectual on race, but also he specializes in linguistics and, and other topics. But I thought this, this would be helpful to share with people because what I think is most important is that we sincerely engage in curious, open dialogue and ask sincere questions with as genuine intentions as we can possibly manage. And then from there, I think collectively we're capable of coming up with solutions, but without the conversations, we don't get anywhere. And so this is my attempt to role model what it's like to ask difficult questions or questions that you might be shy or embarrassed to ask. And I hope that you find it uh, enjoyable. This comes from the Rebel Wisdom community, a community that I am part of and a community that I greatly admire. I think the sort of two people that run it, David and Ali, are great role models to the rest of us. They are doing amazing work, so I really encourage you to check out Rebel Wisdom. And hey, if you want to join that community, maybe I will see you there sometime. Same community where I got to have that conversation with Gabor Mate, which you should check out as well if you're interested in compassionate inquiry and just simply how do we open up to our own pain and suffering and darkness so that we can be more free and perhaps engage in topics that we care about and that are important to us. And for me, the one about race and the one about creating a more cohesive society global community founded on the principles of our common humanity um that's what i ask of you okay so without further ado i hope you enjoy this and i hope you find it uh, insightful and please as always let me know in the comment section share subscribe all that stuff as they say in youtube world um what do they say hit that notification bell makes me sick to say it, but I'm saying it. So anyway, thank you very much and uh, take it easy. Peace. This was a conversation with John McWhorter. John is a professor of linguistics at Columbia University. He's a writer and public intellectual and best known as one of the most compelling speakers on the topic of race in America. His latest book is called Woke Racism and he says he felt he had to write it. This book was written out of duty. I don't think most people quite understand that I don't wake up thinking about these things, that my life is about much more, and that these issues for me are a background business. But given what I was seeing happening to the way people were thinking about black people in this country, particularly over about the past two years, and I've been doing this, as a duty for about 21 years, but especially I decided something needed to be said. I'm hoping that it serves the purpose that I wanted, which is to teach people that you have to stand up to this crowd. You can't just let them have what they want or they're gonna turn the world upside down. The book is subtitled, How a New Religion Has Betrayed Black America. I'm not saying it's like a religion. I'm not making that point to get attention. I had all the attention I wanted before. I'm saying that that religion is real and I, and privileged in that I see myself witnessing the birth of one. It's happening. We are watching a religion being born. You could even think of it as another Abrahamic religion. I'm fascinated by it, but it's also a religion that hurts black people. And as such, I have to speak against it.
This was a conversation and Q&A in our digital campfire. To join conversations like this, check out our membership options below and hope you enjoy it. Hi, John. This is awesome. I love being part of this community. We get to do these amazing things. So I've been listening to you and Glenn and just lots of your talks over the past few years. And I listened to uh, Woke Racism through audiobook. Um, so I'm trying to follow along as best I can and figure out how to insert myself into this because I have a lot of friends who I talk about this stuff all the time. And I really think I need to speak out loud as you often encourage people to do, stand up and say stop or no. So my, my sort of specific question along that line is, I, I want to communicate to maybe the, you know, you had a recent conversation, you've probably had so many with Nathan from, the, um, what was the name of his publication? Current Affairs. Do you remember that? That would be a hard one to forget. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I like, I would like to try to speak to that type of person in a way. So the allies, so to speak, who, who you so nicely put, you know, is told that silence is violence and that they need to let black people speak and shut up type of thing. And you talked a little bit about it with Coleman Hughes, this idea of like the victim mentality and it feels good to feel offended and then project yourself as like morally superior and, and point the finger and be condemning and that kind of stuff. I, 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 so I wonder one, like, I don't see that being pointed out very much. And obviously that's a hard thing to do because it fits into that blaming the victim type of thing. Um, but I do see like FAIR, so I'm part of FAIR Canada or FAIR Ontario, whatever. FAIR seems to be helping promote a much more collective common humanity perspective. And so I guess what I'm just curious about your thoughts are is specifically, and I have a hard time being specific in these questions, is how might we have that common humanity dialogue more thoroughly and then also, it, do you think it's helpful, I guess, for quote unquote white people to quote unquote talk to other white people and help them see their own fear or guilt or shame that they're not like, they don't feel comfortable saying, yeah, that's fucked up. Like, don't call me racist and a white supremacist. Like, what the fuck? I like it's so, so I'm trying to help people like, be able to say that it's not okay to be called those names and just like discounted. And I think I'll stop with that. Thank you for listening. <laughs> well, I think that um, the main thing, if I understand your question, is that in yeah. those conversations, say with other white people, the question should always be, and that helps black people how? And mm -hmm. it should just always be clear. And sometimes people will have answers to that question. It's not like I feel like I've got all of these magic answers, but just the issue is however we discuss this, that helps black people how? And to make sure that that's always what people have in mind, as opposed to just showing that they understand that racism is more than the N-word and burning crosses on people's lawns. I think that needs to very much be there. And I think it's particularly important. It's funny, you mentioned that Nathan Robinson interview. I had a... um. An interview last week with um, a hard left guy who basically jumped me. You know, it was it was it was rather dishonest that he invited me onto his show. But you know, life is not perfect. And the main way that I dealt with him was just that no matter how much he scoffed, no matter how much he laughed, don't break and just keep on saying no. I don't agree with that. No. Notice that I just kept saying no, and he didn't like it, but. It rattled him a little bit because he seemed to think that I was just going to crumple to the ground. People like that are generally under the impression that they have arrived at the ultimate truth. I can see why they think that. You have to let them know that you don't think that they do and make sure that you let them know why you don't think they do. And now, of course, in his case, he's hostile. And you're talking about people who are trying to be nice and drinking tea. What kind of conversation are you going to have? And I think that it's civil to just always ask, let's make sure that we're talking about the good of Black people, realizing that the good for Black people is not simply us sitting around saying that we know racism exists. That's not, that's not enough. What does this imply for society and especially poor Black people who need help? And I think that keeping one's eye on that star can be pretty, can be pretty constructive. 
Well, can I just add to that? Can I add to that quickly, David? Is that mm-hmm. okay? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have I think of one person in particular in mind, a really good friend of mine, black guy, Jamaican family, and he's always talking about like his family is very much against white people. Don't talk to white people. White people are trying to get you, et cetera, et cetera. So he's always like sort of conflicted. And do you see, or what what I find helpful to see is black people expressing that internal dialogue more or BIPOC people, like whatever, like the words make me almost sick to my stomach. Along this context of like, how do we, have more open dialogues about this internal dialogue that the so-called BIPOC POC people are this uh, monolith, right? Like they all think the same, say, I guess it's the same with the whiteness thing, but like, do you see benefit in that? Or do you see that conversation happening much like from, from, I guess the black person side? Well, yeah, I think it's all, it's all very important. There is a kind of black person who just, you know, thinks white people are awful and that's, not going to change. I don't think that that's most black people. And with many of them, you can understand why they might think it, especially with ones who are older, with ones who are younger. I think it's often kind of opposed, but nevertheless. But I think most black people living in the only country that we'll ever know understand that it wouldn't be very constructive to walk around hating white people. There are too many white people and they are too powerful. And so the idea is to break bread and realize, I think for for the black elect, The issue is to understand how exquisitely sensitive to our plight do you really need white people to be? That's something that I've used. I always say, if we're strong, why do you need them to understand so much? And some of them will say, well, they they have the power, they're on the hook. And then I'll say, okay, even with the power, do they need to understand our psychology so exquisitely? I mean, so exquisitely that apparently they never really can. Why are we setting that bar so high? Martin Luther King knew nothing of the sort. That's a good query to throw into the conversation, I think. And that works with Black people really on all parts of the spectrum, in my experience. Cool. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Keep up the great work. It's inspiring to watch. Awesome. Thank you.